Okay, hello everyone. I think that everyone is settling down uh, into joining the session. So let's get started for the interests of time. Thank you so much uh, for attending this panel session, really catered for the ASU online students across the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Um, this first inaugural panel is on how to better engage with our faculty members as online students, and especially talking about and getting feedback on seeking letters of recommendations that uh, a lot of our online students have questions about. So just to get started, um, I would like to introduce our wonderful uh, host of faculty panelists that are joining us today. Um, our wonderful faculty are representing each of our divisions across the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences that include the Humanities, Social Sciences, and Natural Sciences Division. So I would like to uh, turn the mic over to Professor Catherine O'Donnell first and give uh, some moments for her to introduce herself. Thank you, uh, Professor Austin. So I'm Catherine O'Donnell, Professor of History uh, in the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies. So I have colleagues who teach history, who teach philosophy, who teach religion. Um, and I've taught at the graduate level, the undergraduate level, and my own work is on early America, but I also work on um, England and Europe and historical methods. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much. And next, we have Dr. Stotts joining us, representing the social sciences. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I am Dr. Stotts. As said. I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change. Um, so that hosts our anthropology and our global health programs. Um, and I teach um, in both of those programs. And I'm excited to be with you today. Thank you. And finally, we have Dr. Susan Holchek representing the Natural Sciences Division. Uh, good evening, everybody. So thank you so much, Ara, for having me here. Uh, I'm represented in Natural Sciences. Uh, I'm part of the School of Life Sciences. I'm a lecturer. I have taught and I'm teaching Bio 340 for online students and also the director for the School of Life Sciences undergraduate research programs. And we are very happy to have many online students as part of the program and welcoming them every semester for our research immersion week uh, at ASU. Fantastic. So thank you to all of our faculty panelists once again. Um, for my introduction, my name is um, Ara Austin. I am a clinical assistant professor over at the School of Molecular Sciences. Um, I teach primarily online students now uh, because I enjoy teaching online students so much. Um, I teach large lecture courses in organic chemistry, and I'm also the director of the HOURS program, which stands for Online Undergraduate Research Scholars Program. Program, and that offers authentic research experiences to online students within the college. So that includes all of you who are joining here today. So some housekeeping rules. So you may have realized that some features of this Zoom session is really odd. Um, and the reason for that is we want to preserve this recording as a resource so that we can share this recording widely on our ours program website. Um, so that's why you know we can't see each other's participant list um, other than us moderators uh, for to saving your privacy. And also in order to minimize, you know, a lot of things that can go back and forth. Um, the only function that's allowed in the webinar version of Zoom is the Q&A function. So you, we will have a preset of determined questions that are in regards to the topic for the panel today. Um, so, you know, we will go through those questions and each of our faculty panelists will answer them. But your questions specifically may not be addressed in the panel yet by the panelists. So you can submit those in the Q&A feature and then we will go through and answer those questions as, as we get going. So um, I hope that everyone's ready to have an engaging conversation. I'm sorry that you can't um, have your microphones on, but that is really for your privacy purposes, so on and so forth, because hopefully this recording will live uh, forever and ever on our website. So here we go. 
So the first question is something that um, I hear about very commonly when working with online students. And, and that is about you know, engaging with your faculty members. So the real question here to start us off is what are some ways in which online students can engage with, uh, with our panelists and other faculty members that would result in a meaningful connection? And so we will go around with each of our panelists. Catherine, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I'll just say a few things because I know we'll all have um, have different ideas. So I would first of all say, be confident that your faculty want to communicate with you, right? So do not feel like you're bothering someone ever. We want to communicate with you. That's the best part of being a professor. Um, other than the books, for me, I'm an historian or the lab or whatever. Um, and I would say another thing to, to remember is that you can make a meaningful connection by not knowing something as well as by doing really well. So I enjoy it when a student reaches out either in an email or in a forum or in a discussion board in any in any part of a course and and has a specific I want to understand this better question or I don't understand this concept or I'm interested in that concept. That is terrific, um, and it's a great way to sort of make yourself known to a professor as someone who wants to do your best, right? As someone who is engaged, as someone who's doing the essential thing of learning, um, which is asking questions. So that I would start us off with that um, and then sort of pass the baton. All right. Uh, Dr. Stotts, would you like to add anything? Yeah, sure. I would just say um, to add, that was great. I mean, that covered a lot of what I was thinking. I also just see like what uh, opportunities maybe um, faculty have for um, extra engagement. For example, in all my classes, I offer like pre what I call pre-deadline feedback for assignments. And it's the students, who, I, I have very few students reach out for this. Um, but it's always the students who do reach out for that, that I, I tend to remember their names. And like when they come back and they're like, oh, like I took your class. I'm like, oh, OK, I actually can remember your work because I didn't just grade it in a pile of 100 other papers at that time. I had like taken it aside and like looked at it and then been able to see how you took that feedback and improved it. So I'll turn it over. Fantastic. Susan? Great. So um, actually, this is a very important question. Um, I teach genetics. Usually we have 350 plus students every session. Uh, and I think the most minimal connect meaningful connection I have done with the students is through office hours. So I host a couple office hours every week. Each one lasts between one hour and two hours each. I get to know my students. They ask questions. We work through the activities. Uh, in my book, there is no right or wrong answer, so it, com it becomes a very interactive platform for me. And for those students who are working and they cannot join live, um, you know, those recordings are posted, they watch a the recording, they follow up with me, and, you know, they have some questions that I need to clarify. So that's how I get to know them. So I think, uh, you know, being participant, uh, I know online classes um, give the students the freedom of Kind of taking them whenever they can, right? And when do, working at, at their own pace. But at the same time, I think my recommendation would be to try to connect with faculty. As faculty, we offer office hours. We offer of different ways on how students can connect with us. So take advantage of those because those are the students that we will remember later. Absolutely. And I think um, all of you brought a very important point. And one thing that I always tell students is that there's never a right time, meaning everyone is busy, including the students themselves. So, you know, don't hesitate on reaching out. I mean, the receiver can take time to respond to you or, or respond to you, perhaps maybe sometimes in a non-timely ma matter, 
But, you know, something that you can always do is being proactive and just going, well, it's never the right time. So I'm going to just email them, right? So, um, you know, being confident and having that courage, I know it's really scary to reach out, but I think that's something that I always recommend and taking advantage of all the extra things that, um, that our panelists are talking about. So let's move on to the second question. And so this is going kind of segueing into what we just talked about in the first question, which is, okay, so you get the courage to write the email, you know you have to do it, but then it's that fear, what do I include in there? Um, and that's certainly something that students uh, talk to me about all the time. Um, so what does a good email from a student look like? And what do they include? And what are some key etiquettes that students should follow? Dr. O'Donnell? Sure. Um, and this is a good, a good form for practicing, right? Because you're going to be writing polite emails um, when you have a job, right? If you go to graduate school, so you may as well start with us. Um, and uh, always good to have a, a greeting, salutation, right? And uh, dear professor is terrific. You cannot go wrong with dear professor. I think my fellow panelists will probably agree. Um, and then make sure you sign off sincerely. Um, it's good to make it easy for your faculty member, right? Like just make it easy for them to know what's going on. So maybe the course and the subject heading um, uh, is good. Sometimes you email through Canvas, but emailing directly and putting the subject heading is good. And then be clear about what your question or concern or your request to meet is, right? Um, don't be embarrassed about it. Be straightforward about it, whether it's I don't understand this. Can I set up office hours? And I've looked through the FAQs and I now need direct help or can I have a meeting? Just uh, make sure that it's sort of directly and politely stated in, in the email. So I would say those are my basics, um, but let's see what everybody else uh, has to say. Dr. Stotts? Yeah, my one of my big key points when I talk to the students about emails is being really clear about what class you're in or you or you have been in with me. Um, for example, I often teach like our introduction to cultural anthropology class, both in person and online at the same time. So when I'm talking about being clear, it's often even just not even saying like, I'm taking this class, like I'm taking introduction to cultural anthropology. It's like, I'm taking cultural introduction, to cultural anthropology online with you. I'm like, okay, I know exactly what you're asking, like which class you're talking about. And if you're emailing me after the fact, remind me like what semester so I can go like, look at, look at that. The other thing I want to follow up with um, from Dr. O'Donnell is um, the, uh, about like being really clear about what you're asking, I think is really important. Um, like if you are asking me for, to set up a meeting, giving me a range of times that you can do that meeting, is it going to be a lot easier than this back and forth where I'm going to say, okay, well, I have these time slots available. What time slots do you have available? Like if you were just included that in the first email, I'd be like, okay, I'm also available this time. We have one email back to you with the Zoom invitation. We have the meeting set up. Um, or if you are, you know, asking a question like I don't understand something in a class um, you know giving me more of like uh, I know it can be really hard when you don't understand something to maybe articulate what it is you're struggling with but giving as many details as possible like if you're emailing um, about like a content question be like I don't understand like this can you like this thing you talked about in this lecture can you talk about it some more with me or um, if you're having a technical issue like give me a screenshot of what it looks like. Like, I can't get it to work. Like, well, what does your screen look like? It looks different for me. Um, so just as basically as much information um, as you can up front, I think really helps me to understand um, what I can do to help, so. Fantastic, Dr. Holchek. So I would like to add that um, sometimes I get emails from students that they are not using their ASU account. So they have these weird names. I'm like, I don't know if this is a spam email. I don't even open it. 
So it's part of my syllabus that please use your ASU email account. I mean, that's I think that's the proper way to do it because I have no idea who they are. Just judging for that weird first part of the email. Um, the other thing that I appreciate is when they put some context into their email. So it's like, what do they need? If there is a specific question, you know, I ask the students, please take a screenshot of the of the video lecture what's happening um you know so so be very clear and concise uh we teach a, these classes are massive we have a lot of students so including uh as much detail as possible uh would be great uh sometimes i have students that they misspell my last name so i never got their email and it's like you never reply well you never send it to the right recipient so it's a lot of you know the, take your time pause grab a really good email use proper salutation it's not you're not sending a text message to your friends you're actually communicating with faculty um so again you know so the simple things and and in my opinion those are the emails that when the students reach out later in the semester or maybe a semester later i just do you know go through my messages put the name and i have the history track of all the emails that these students sent to me and it's kind of like give give me a sense of you know more about who 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 is this person who's asking me for something else later on. Yeah, following up with the emails from ASU email accounts too. I'll mention that the spam filter at ASU I feel like has gotten even stronger over the past two years. And every time I go into it, I find an email from a student, um, and I don't remember to go into it very often, um, but. Um, sometimes it's not that we're like you send it from a weird app and just, we don't even know it's spam it's I didn't didn't receive it because it went directly to my spam this is it will not go to your spam if it's coming from an ASU email account so that's a, a good strategy and on that um, sort of a almost following up from that sometimes I will forget to reply to an email and it is not your fault <laughs> And so I uh, would advise you that if you send a polite email and you don't hear back, give it one more try. I don't know if maybe a panelist might disagree with me, but that's that's my that's my view. So don't assume you've done anything wrong. Don't assume we don't care. Assume we are frail human beings who sometimes get too much email. And sometimes, if this makes you feel better, sometimes it's the interesting email. And I'm like, okay, I don't want to just dash something off quickly. I want to think about it. <gasps> oh my goodness. And then, you know, it, it goes by. So yeah, give it, give it that that second try would be my thought if you don't hear back. Yeah, I actually have listed my course policies that if you don't hear back from me within 48 hours to email me again. And that's, I feel like that's just a good general rule for any, like if you want to email me after the fact of a class too. Um, like if I am currently teaching a class that has 600 students, it's one of three classes I'm teaching. So I have about a thousand students right now. Like on the day that the 600 person class email like assignment is due, I will probably get around a probably almost up to 100 emails that day with extension requests, additional information requests, am I doing this right questions. And if you email me that day, your email has probably just gone onto the second page of my email and I just missed it. All great points. And um, adding to that also, because this is a panel in um, in connection with making a good example of yourself to receive a letter of rec, ultimately, right? So, you know, faculty love it when the email is not always about, can I get an extension? Or, um, or what do I do on the day of the deadline? I know that online students are extremely busy, right? You're all adult learners and you have your obligations. We totally get it. I think the four of us on this panel wouldn't have this panel if we didn't care about our students, right? Uh, but, you know, I love the emails when it's really fun and engaging and it's just very simple even it's it, it's simple as the student is just letting me know who they are as an individual or what's going on in their life but it's in the middle of the week when nothing's really due they're just reaching out just to you know build that relationship with me those are always welcome and if it includes a uh, topic that's related to the discipline we teach we love that even more so you know some things like that are something like a small thank you card you know a small something it, 
it, it, that, those are the notes that we enjoy receiving and that goes miles for you. So that's another tip that um, I'd like to add. So let's go to question number three. So in the case that let's imagine the student wants to ask you for a letter of reference or recommendation, how should they go about asking for one? And are there key things that you are really looking for in a student? And this may vary per faculty, but you know, if we could all share um, our input, that'd be great. Dr. O'Donnell? Sure. So think about what you need, right? So what kind of program or career or opportunity are you applying for? What skills or experiences will that organization want you to have? And then which of your faculty is going to be able to say, yeah, you know how to do those things, or yes, you've thought in those ways, or you've learned those things. Um, and then reach out to that faculty member. It's usually not a perfect fit, right? Because college is not exactly like a graduate program or, or a job. So sometimes what you need is someone who will, who will know this person thinks hard and works hard and is timely and asks good questions. Um, and you'll have made meaningful connections and sent cogent, polite emails, see above, right? See questions one and two. And then you'll reach out to a faculty member who seems appropriate. Um, and then what I want is to be able to have a conversation or at least some correspondence with you to find out like, what is the match, right? Why do you want to do this? What are your qualifications, right? And not in, and I'm on your side, right? I tell students, I want to write the best letter possible for you. So help me to understand how you are a match with this program, right? Like I know your skills, I know your wonderful attributes. Help help me shape that into a full letter by giving me a sense of why those skills and attributes align with what this program wants. And also sometimes like I won't know that you taught swim class for eight years, you know, and you got up at four in the morning and like, you know, whatever, I, all, these things too, don't think those don't matter, right? Because those also help round out a, a letter. Um, so that's how I would start off the conversation. Fantastic. And Dr. Stotts, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I think it goes back to that question one about like what you know, good isn't a good email is uh, just giving a, as much information as you can up front, but um, concisely, um, right? So um, if you are coming to me and asking me for a letter of recommendation, um, I'd like to know why you turn to me, why you think I could write a good letter of recommendation. I want to know what it is that the letter of recommendation is for. Are you applying for a scholarship? Like what kind of scholarship could you provide me a link to it? Are you applying to graduate programs? What kind of graduate programs? Why are you going to graduate school? What do you think you're going to get out of it? Um, if you're applying to graduate school, are, like do you already have um, your statement of purpose, um, like a draft of it, or like do you have a resume or a CV that you could share with me? Um, a lot of those things, just providing them up front, can be really helpful um for you and um I guess it um that maybe I'm kind of getting my ahead of myself I know what the questions are that are coming <laughs> um but um you know you you do have to think strategically about who you're asking for your letters of reference um I I do get email I get a lot of requests from students who took one class with me and never like interacted beyond turning in assignments and I'm honest and I say in response, like, you know, I, it's not that I don't want to, it's that I, I honestly don't think I can, can comment on anything other than like you had strong writing skills and you turned in assignments on time. Um, I, and I also say like, I've written letters of recommendation for students who don't turn in assignments on time. Like, I'm not just looking for like an automaton who can do something like, 
I've I've had a student who um, you know had to take it incomplete in a class, and I wrote a letter of recommendation for them, and I talked about like the them overcoming some of those things that were barriers for them to be successful, and like that actually was I was actually because of that able to talk more about them um, than just like a student who you think looks like a perfect student on paper, but I can't then if they've never interacted with me, talk to them. So I have some more stuff to say, but I'll share with later questions. Great, Dr. Holchek. And this is actually a really good question. I think the way I will rephrase this is, can I write a strong letter recommendation for you? Right, I think the key would be a strong letter of recommendation or a strong letter of reference. I think that's what the students need to, you know, go to an internship or apply to a grad school, et cetera. And if I'm not in the position of writing a strong letter of recommendation, I will let a student know. So like, you know, I this is the first time you appear in my emails, even though you have taken the class, there was no single communication. I never seen your, your name in office hours, nothing. So again, you know, so that's a big difference. And sometimes the students don't realize that. Do you want a letter of reference or do you want a strong one? If you want a strong letter of recommendation, I think you need to start working like since day one, even before classes start, build a rapport, build a connection with the faculty. Uh, and I sometimes I have to be really honest and say, I'm sorry, I cannot, because my letter will be one paragraph. I don't know this person, you know, and they, and so it's, it's hard, it's hard. So again, you know, you need to, everybody is going to need a letter in one point or another. So I think start working early on, make that con that meaningful connection, be respectful in your emails, attend office hours, watch the recordings, whatever, you know, even with the grad TAs. You know, you can also build connections with, this, with the TAs who are helping in the class. There's a lot of things that could be done. Um, and, you know, again, if, if the student is somebody that I have seen, then, of course, you know, okay, you know, I know, you know, you talk about this. I even know about, you know, and as your family, you showed your pet on camera. I don't know. They have some sort of connection. And I see them every week attending and taking notes and following up with questions. And of course, I will write a letter because I have a sense of who you are. Uh, rather than somebody that is not even it's the first time that your name appears in, you know, in my outlook, it's, it's very, very different. So, so keep that in mind, you know, it's something to think about. And I would just follow up sort of the other side of that is when you do have a faculty member who has agreed to write a letter of reference and you have a, like a mentoring relationship or good professorial relationship, you can ask for more letters of reference, right? At least in my case, I'll have like a body, you know, a basic letter of reference, and then I'll adjust it, right, for the situation. But sometimes I realize students are just in agony because they're like, ah, oh, I've already asked you for three. I can't ask. No, it, 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 right? I think, yeah, we're all nodding. We'll have our basic thing. We know who you are. We're, we're like on your team at this point. And it is honestly not you should not hesitate to ask that same faculty member for for a number of of letters it's much less work to do five for one person than to do three for three people dr stotts did you have a comment on that no i was just going to wholeheartedly agree that once i have a free it's making the entire framework and then personalizing it for whatever you're applying for is so much easier then actually the, like, that's the, I could do that in like five minutes. It takes me several hours to construct the initial actual recommendation about you. It's so funny because I just wrote a letter of recommendation today and uh, I had a copy of the letter for this particular student for a different thing last year. And so it's a different thing, but you know, I'm just adding on to whatever this person did from last year to this year to flush it out, to meet the standards. But, um, you know, so that's totally agree with both of your points. I think that it's very important, you know, and this is something I want to really stress to the students who are listening, 
you know, with like anything in life, when you build a relationship, the ones that, you know, whoever you have friends with, whoever that you have in your inner circle, those relationships are beyond the trans transactional relationships. So, you know, it's good to build those mentoring relationships with the faculty that you know that you can get a sense from the classes that they really care about the students. And it's worth always reaching out and building those relationships with those faculty members because you never want to get into a place at the end of your degree program where you remember some of the faculty were really nice people, they were very good teachers, and then you never made the connection when it was opportune, and then now it's later in the fact that you have to go back years in time when that faculty has already taught, you know, slew of other courses and had slew of cohorts of other students. So it's really hard to make a meaningful connection at that point. So I always encourage, you know, make the connection when you have the chance, when you're in that person's course or you're working for them or you're doing research with them, whatever it is to build that connection that's beyond the transactional. Yeah, I will say it is, it is harder, but it's not impossible. So mm -hmm. if you're like taking this, like watching the seminar and like you're in your last semester and you're like, I've never done this. Like I do think I will have meetings with students who I had like a year or two ago and follow up with them and be like, okay, well, we didn't make that connection now, but like, can we, can we talk about it and like why we're coming back to it? Yeah. I also say in terms of like, just, oh, sorry, with the like writing multiple letters that um, it's always good to think about like, this is a relationship we're building now and so telling me what happened with previous letters and what you applied for is good too um just in terms of that relationship building it's it's nice to know like oh i did get that scholarship or i did get that opportunity or i didn't i mean let me tell you i've got many more rejections in my life than i've ever gotten acceptances or things um, but telling us how um, you did kind of helps them to follow up and build that relationship. Um, and, you know, it, it also shows to your faculty member that you care about the time that they put in mm -hmm. to follow up with them and let them know the outcome. Absolutely. Everyone likes the email where the student goes, oh, you wrote the letter for me and I got accepted to this or hey, you know, it didn't work out, then it's kind of a bonding moment too in both ways. So you should always follow up. Um, that, that's a really good point. So question number four um, is also in relation to letter of rec and timeliness. So when should the students request for the letter of recommendation or reference? And this can vary by faculty too. So we have different opinions. That's why we have the panel. And also how far in advance should the student notify the faculty? Dr. O'Donnell? Yes. Um, I, I think that the second part is easier. I mean, if if you can give them a month, I mean, it seems like you should always be able to give a month's notice. Um, generally, these opportunities don't leap out from behind bushes. <laughs> they're, they're sort of posted. Um, uh, then that's that's great. You know, um, if, if you have a relationship with me and something does suddenly come up, right, or I've been writing letters for you and then something comes up unexpectedly, then shorter, but I would, I would shoot for a month. Um, and I guess the, the first part, I'm, I'm interested in what other people have to say. I, I think that you want to, you want to have let give develop some kind of relationship with us student to professor right ideally with a mentoring component um so that we have a sense of of who you are um and then even like i've had students sort of just say even um before anything is available i think i might want to become a museum curator i think i might want to go into public history or i think i might want to go to graduate school and sometimes they won't even say like would you be a reference and i'll say oh um are you interested are, are you interested in in a reference let's let's start that process right so it, i mean it really is a process of um being able to write a, a good letter of reference so I guess I might turn the first part of that of this paragraph into like when do you start building the relationship the mentoring relationship with your professor and the answer is as early as possible and then to kind of drop into that the possibility of of serving as a reference I don't know let's see what Dr. No I agree with that and I think I don't think it think some students think 
it's kind of like mercenary to like go in and be like I'm going I'm going to be developing this relationship so that I have a letter of recommendation writer and like I'm fine if you're upfront about that I mean there's that's not going to in any way put me off um like I realize that that that's the students need um to figure out and cultivate those relationships and so being honest about that is fine um yeah but I, I basically agree with exactly with Dr. Don my absolute minimums I will not take any requests if they come in um less than two weeks um unless I have previously written you a letter so um but a month is m a much better turnaround time because even in two weeks that can be really hard for me sometimes Dr. Holchek? That's an interesting one. Um, when to request one, I think it's going to be up to the student. You know, um, you guys are here in your second year, third year, you know what you want to do with the, with your degree by then. So you have to start planning accordingly. You know, what are the key classes uh, where you're going to meet faculty that are going to be relevant for that letter? Uh, how far in advance? Uh, you know, I think the earlier, the better. And the, this is a reason. So I, 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 you say a month, a month, and first, oh, oops. Sorry about that. Like typical online with the dogs in the background. Anyway, so um, I would say maybe six weeks in advance. And there, this is the reason because when all these letters are due for grad school, they're all due at the same time. So this is what I personally do. You know, I the sooner the better because I start creating my list. And I have, you know, we're humans. There is a limit, right? I cannot be writing like 20 letters. That's, I have other thousands of students to take care of. So uh, the sooner the better, you're in my list. Okay, I kind of do, I really have my list. And I go, and then when I, once I read, she said, no, that, that's, that's going to be tough because it's not only that you have those online students, you also have your in-person students who are also applying, who you have already built a, a connection for years. So there's a lot of priorities as well. So start the sooner the better. Um, I, I've seen cases where I never met the students and know that they were really good, they were in office hours, and online students are so creative, Ara. Uh, they made a website for their reference writers and they put, you know, this is what I did in Costa Rica. This is unbilingual. I, you know, they were in the military and, and it's like they created a website just for, you know, ex these are examples of my writing. These are like pictures of me working with the children in the orphanage. I'm like, of course, I'm going to write a letter because even though I haven't met you in person, you're showing me your whole life. You know, and it's like a private thing that they create just for those people who can write a letter for them. And it's like, that's fantastic. So again, you know, you guys are creative, start in advance. The when is, you know, the sooner the better uh, in my book, because deadlines are going to be not only grad school applications. There is that, those, you know, that month is comes very, very complex. Uh, so the sooner, six weeks is perfect because if the faculty doesn't answer to that email, then you follow up the next week. So those, you know, those six weeks now turn into five weeks. And, and that's how we get closer to that, you know, the sweet month that we need for, for this. And remind me, you know, five days before, after I send you a, a questionnaire that I always send my students, these are the five questions. You need to answer this, attach your CV and attach your transcript. If they do that, I, it helps me uh, build a better, um, you know, a notion of who they are and everything. So that's just me. I need more yeah. time. <laughs> no, that's that's totally true. I actually had a student who I had, I think, I had her as a freshman and th now she's a senior. Um, and I saw the name pop up and I didn't recognize the name, but I recognized her face. So she had attached the photo of herself in this email and said, hey, Dr. Austin, I know you have hundreds of students, but you may not remember my name, but this is what I look like. I sat, you know, I came to your office hours and this and, you know, and it was a photo over and I said, oh, no, I know the student, <laughs> right? So sometimes you need those little visual cues. And I always say like, it, it's, a, it's actually a really good tactic and, you know, putting it in there so that it triggers our memories as well. But um, I also think at the end of the course, and let's say, you know, a student and I built a really good relationship throughout the class, 
it's nice to ask the faculty at the end, you know, thank you for a great class. I enjoyed working with you through this class that, you know, I am looking to apply to graduate school, medical school, whatever it is, tell them the goal and ultimately that you will need a letter. So it prevents, preempts, you know, in the long run that, you know, you had an agreement set already when you already had this uh, very nice relationship, you know, at the culmination of the course, you know, so usually that's what happens. And in, in my, my uh, experience, I had, you know, four or five students reach out at the end of the session A course, and, you know, they, they're looking to apply in like a year of time, right? So, um, and so I alert them, let me know, remind me, you know, when the time comes closer, about two months in advance, and then we'll go from there and we can talk it out, right? So those are really good strategies um, and, and a good wrap up to, to any course relationship. So final question that's predetermined, and then you can start typing your questions out in the Q&A. Um, as we answer this one, if something that you are burning to ask has not been answered yet. Um, but here is question number five. So what if the faculty member says no to the student's request for a letter uh, of reference? Sorry, not letter, letter or reference. Yeah. So what should the student do now? Um, and, you know, hopefully we can give some pr pragmatic advice to the students. Dr. O'Donnell? Yeah, as... Um you know, Dr. Stott sort of already alluded to, sometimes we can't write a good reference, right? Sometimes we don't know enough about you to write a good reference, or sometimes, you know, I, I tell students like, mine is a strange little kingdom. Only certain things happen in it, right? History. Um, and just didn't, you know, I just didn't see enough in my weird little kingdom. That doesn't mean you're not successful in a million other ways a million maybe more important ways outside strange little kingdom of history um but whatever it is if if i tell you or someone tells you we can't write a letter of reference it's that it wouldn't serve you either because we don't have enough time or we don't have enough a relationship with you or something we can't show that you match whatever institution you're trying to join so um one thing to do would be to think about what what is the problem with this request, right? Is it that you only gave the faculty member a week? That's a hard one to solve. If if we told you no because you left so little time, that's challenging. It's going to be hard to find someone then who can do it that quickly. And then you might think, can I delay my application and enter in a different cycle? Or it could be, you know, whoever you asked needed six weeks. And in that case, yeah, try somebody else, right? Because I just need a month, right? Um, uh, if someone says they didn't get to know you well enough, just think, okay, I didn't develop a mentoring relationship with this faculty member. Who did I work more closely with, right? And not necessarily whose class did you do better in? Maybe you got an A in this class, but that is still not the, the person who knows how to explain the wonderfulness of you, right? Maybe it's the class you got to be in or an A minus and that that faculty member can do it. So just, it's hard. I know it's hard, but like, take it as information. Okay, that no was information. What can I do with that information in order to find a different answer to this question, a different person to help me? So that's how I would start us off. Fantastic. Dr. Stotts? Yeah, I, I would hope that the faculty member kind of gives an explanation um, as to why they're saying no. Um, I always do if um, I say no. Um, and again, it's it's almost always the, the um, uh, like, I don't feel like I can write a strong letter issue. Um, I usually I see usually students are asking me with enough time um there's a cup like this summer I had a student ask me who I would have loved to have written a letter for um but I was experiencing a number of family emergencies and like and that was more of like a even with a month I can't do it right now um but I, I explained that to them so hopefully they do I will also note here though that um, there are certain times where like I actually have a written letter of recommendation policy that I some, will sometimes send to students and say like, do you meet these any like these things? Um, and 
there's a couple of things on there that like automatically is, um, I'll write a letter of recommendation. So I actually run study, uh, typically run study abroad programs in the summer. So ASU study abroad, um, they're the short-term programs. I know it's, there are a lot of money, there are scholarships, but there are a lot of money. Um, and I know that like, if you have kids, it's really hard to um, negotiate that. If you have a full-time job that doesn't have a lot of vacation time, also hard to negotiate. Um, but if you do a study abroad with me, I will write you a letter of recommendation. No questions asked. Um, because I have basically lived and worked with you for three weeks. There's no chance that I cannot speak to basically anything anyone would ever want to know on a reference letter. Um, I also run like a, a program we hear called Early Start. Um, I, I actually kind of always refer to that as like a, um, it's for on-campus students, but it's a, um, I call it a study abroad on campus where it's like um, incoming students. We spend like two weeks together introducing you know, like all the resources here at ASU. I will always write one of those students a letter of recommendation because I've spent so much time with them. Um, students who've done research in, I, uh, in a lab that I direct, I will always write them a letter of recommendation because I spend so much time with them. So you can kind of, you can also search out those um, kind of unique opportunities like ours like if you are part of ours, you probably are developing that mentorship relationship with a faculty member so they can speak to those types of things, so. Thank you, Dr. Stotts. And finally, Dr. Holchek. So I think uh, this was uh, mentioned earlier, but uh, I would say try again if you don't get a reply. So it's, it's not a no until it's a no in an email. And I think my main, my main concern is I cannot write you a strong letter of recommendation. And the reason is, it's very simple. A lot of these um, fellowships, jobs, they always require like a whole two pages of little boxes that we need to click on top of the letter. And those boxes has questions very specific about the student. You know, like, is this person, uh, what are the writing skills, communication skills, you know, uh, you know, able to work in a team, able to think on their own. Uh, a lot of things that if I'm not familiar with the student, they're going to fail, even if I write a letter of recommendation. And it's because we don't have that connection, especially for sciences. All the fellowships that I have always submitted a letter they have an extra questionnaire of like 20 or more questions like for med school or for grad school and they are very explicit about the the type of uh, connection you have to the student it's starting like how long have you met the student in what capacity you know provide examples of this and and if you put let's say you know okay actually oh no excellent 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 they want you to provide examples why do you think this student is excellent so again, you know, my fear is if, if if I cannot write a strong letter, it's because I won't be able to back up, you know, all these things that the program will ask me later on. So start building a connection early on. And maybe, you know, when I was a grad student, I was also writing letters for, un for undergrads. So maybe you didn't have the time to go to office hours because you were working, but what if you were attending those uh, office hours late at night with a TA? and you build a connection with this grad TA because you were there consistently, you can ask this grad TA. This grad TA could be a PhD candidate, could be also have a master's degree. So, so keep those options in mind. You know, it's, it's not just faculty, but we have a lot of support, you know, uh, for the students and you can request letters from them. I, I see like even advising, like advice of providing letters for the students because they build a connection. So again, it's not just faculty, um, whoever gets to know you, whoever knows your strengths, I think that's the person that would be the ideal one to write you a letter. Fantastic. And I think those are what wraps up the set number of questions. And, you know, with the strong letter, like that's why I think the panel today is really about engagement. You know, strong letter problem gets kind of resolved if you have a strong relationship with the faculty that's very engaging, right? So it really comes down to building that relationship. And I know some of the faculty members aren't, you know, like the most approachable or they don't seem like the most approachable. But And, and I know that we ask a lot of courage from the students to go approach us. Um, but I always find it shocking that students 
students think I'm very scary sometimes. Um, and then they get to know me and they're like, you're not scary at all. And I was like, I was never scary. No one ever thinks that. Um, um, so it, it is it is very interesting what the students think about you. And so, you know, and that is something that, you know, the faculty uh, should be aware of as well, right? But um, but there, what it goes back to, you know, when we teach courses, there's usually just us and some of our graduate students. And then there is hundreds of students in our courses. Um, and so it is easier for us to build a connection if you simply reach out. Um, and that is going to make a real big difference in the long run. Um, oh, one great question. So one question uh, from Miranda is, what is a good way to reconnect with the former professor in general and not just about a letter of recommendation? Would anyone like to answer that one? So um, maybe because I'm an historian, but I get emails. In fact, I've had two this week from former students that have just had a history thought or they've visited somewhere and then they're like oh I thought of our class because I was in Salem um thought of which is thought of you professor Donald um or another student who was in Rome and I just love those those emails or sometimes it's even somebody watched a documentary you know I'll get like I'll get emails and they'll say I watched a documentary about John Adams and I'm embarrassed to tell my friends but I can tell you because I know I know you love history too and we're just uh, we're just always I mean I'm sure every discipline has has some equivalent right like I thought of a philosophical question or I thought of a question about human evolution and 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 just remembered your class right and it can be two or three lines does not have to be anything fancy and it is just so welcome just so completely welcome Yeah, I'm going to be perfectly honest that um, I got an email a couple of weeks ago. I was having a bad, couple really bad few weeks um, personally, and a student emailed me. They were a Starbucks partner, had taken my ethics of eating course, um, and then had been invited to like be in this conversation with like the CEO of Starbucks and was talking to them about some of the things that they had learned about like the food transport systems and things and like how much they appreciate it. And I, I honestly, I started crying. <laughs> And I was like, thank you so much. Like, it was like one of those times where I was like, what do I, like, what do I do? What am I doing? Like, it's not making any difference in the world. And then like somebody emailed me and I was like, oh, somebody cares. <laughs> um, and I think um, to answer like Nicolette's question, I think sending a thank you note, even when it's like, and then asking them for a letter of recommendation, it, there's, it's never too late to send a thank you note. And I don't think it's, it's, it's not shameful to say like, I've always wanted to send this, but I haven't gotten around to it. And like, I've been thinking about you because I want a letter of recommendation. I'm not going to think like, oh, you're just sucking up to me. Um, I mean, I might a little bit, <laughs> but it's okay to do that a little bit, right? A little bit brown nosing. Um, and uh, so I don't think, um, I guess, in, I don't think you need to can be concerned about seeming mercenary. Um, uh the issue about, uh, and then the issue about time constraints, again, um, you can email me anytime. The bigger issue, right, is like setting up um, meetings for Zoom because like I have my own obligation. So that might be a little bit more difficult, um, but just reaching out and asking, um, there's no harm in asking and trying to figure out something, so. I think I, I would agree with that, I mean, Online students, they are in different time zones. They're always welcome to reach out. Uh, it's always nice to get a thank you. <laughs> yeah, and, and maybe that would be, I don't know, hopefully it's not the first time the students contact contacted you, um, you know, through the class. But, you know, it's, it's, again, it, it, you will evaluate, uh, think as faculty, it's like, oh, yeah, okay, well, that's a, that was very nice, you know. And then later you can follow up maybe a week later, if by the way, you know, so this is what's happening. And, but again, you know, it's at least you're in that um, moment of time where, okay, let's, let's see if we can meet. I know Zoom meetings are going to be hard because we are also teaching in person and we have all these other classes and obligations. Um, but if we can, 30 minutes, 15 minutes, if we can keep it short and sweet and, you know, meaningful, why not? Right, and and then we can follow up through an through an email. So I I understand. I've I think I have like over five thousand students so far, 
I remember still the ones who were in office hours and were able to follow up after the class. Um, don't be afraid. We don't bite. Ara is nice. Trust me. Uh, so we are here to help you. We we are here to support online students. So uh, it would be up to you to break the ice. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to attend office hours and start building those connections. You know, like it, I think you realize that maybe at the end of the semester um, you start uh, loving the class a little more, you know, be, uh, and you are going to also build a network with other students as well. It's not just faculty. Networking with other online students is fantastic. I see when they come to the immersion for the week, everybody knows each other. Everybody's hugging each other. It's like, oh my goodness, you know, it's, it's, it's fantastic. So it's not just faculty, but be the connection with other online students because that's a great support group as well. Fantastic. And I think I and I accidentally answered Rachel's question in the uh, Q&A, um, and she went on to say, um, and it disappeared, but she went on to ask if um, she visited the, uh, the A in Arizona, and she did the geography of Arizona, and um, reached out to the professor with excitement uh, when she recently visited and they emailed back and forth. Is casual conversation about class topics annoying or waste of our time? No, I don't think any faculty think that. Those are the fun stuff. So, um, and also too, I mean, if the faculty is continuously engaging with you, then that means they're interested, right? So usually if, if they're not in, engaged, then they would stop responding So, or or there would be some delay. So I wouldn't fear that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, students reach out to me about various different things uh, from their personal lives with me. And I like those. I mean, that gives a nice break to all the things that I have to work with in a given day. So I would say keep sending those and don't uh, don't stop, right? Um, let's see. A good question. Another question is what makes someone a standout candidate for a strong letter of recommendation for grad school besides a general email etiquette, attendance of office hours? More specifically in recent years, what qualities can you remember any candidate having that set them apart from others that had an established relationship, great GPA, attendance, etc.? That's a great question. I mean, uh, students will sometimes just engage really deeply with part of the material, right? So I'll remember someone who sometimes really disliked a reading and explained, you know, why that reading didn't work uh, for for that you know, for that assignment or why they disapproved of the critical analysis of that reading. Um, uh, sometimes a student will, see a thread in a course that is there, but is not something that maybe we've emphasized as a faculty member, right? Like just finding a theme that they pursue. Some kind of, um, some kind of engagement with the material or with the methodology that goes beyond what I am specifically telling you to think about and do and comes from the student, right? It, and that can take all different shapes and forms. And it again, it can be sometimes confusion. It doesn't have to be a beautiful performance, right? It can be a student that persistently says, I do not understand what you mean by colonialism. And <laughs> I'm going to continue to pursue this route, right? So, um, so be yourself. I mean, that's easy to say, but like yourself engaging with the material and then letting the faculty member know how you're doing that, making that a little bit visible um, by going that extra mile, maybe in an office hours or in a discussion board or in sending a draft, as Dr. Stott said. Um, though, those are the students that I remember, or someone who will say, I think I want to do something with history or with um, religious studies, and I'm not sure what. Even like, can I, can I, can I set up a Zoom with you to talk about what I might possibly do with all this cool stuff? Um, that those I remember those students also, right? Because they want to figure out how they can bring these content and skills forward in their lives. So those are those are some ways. But you're more memorable than you think you are, honestly. Like you say and write interesting things all the time. I always hear faculty commenting on that. 
I would like to add a couple of things. So um, in office hours, uh, again, for me, there is no right or wrong answer. And I always notice the students who want to help the other students, you know, so empathy. Empathy is, is like great, you know, because there are different levels. Everybody knows a little bit more of something. And when they are helping each other, it's like, wow, you know, this person's actually helping their peers in the chat with this question. Uh, also, uh, in my class, I, of, I always offer bonus points. They work in groups. So those who are leaders, they always stand out because they are, you know, they organize their team, you know, even through different time zones. And, you know, those group leaders um, are always the ones who, you know, I, I always remember. And I always tell the students, yes, not, not just work on this project because of the bonus points, because remember that when I'm going to write a letter, I will remember your project. I will see that podcast, that video, that week site, whatever your group created. And if you're a group leader, it means that you actually brought the whole group on board to do that. So I would say leadership and empathy will be another, a couple of the qualities that I admire from my students. Yeah, I, I think another one is overcoming barriers. Um, those, I mean, but what both of what you said are, yes, 100 percent but um and then um i don't require students i'm very much i don't require students to tell me like why they need extensions i don't want you to feel like obligated to have to tell me your life story or like things that are happening to you um but if you want to build that relationship sharing some of that is going to have to be part of that right i think and um you know it's not the students who like really um the best in my class um that maybe are the ones that stand out to me it's the ones who like I know like they had all these things going on and they still tried to make an effort um and in that regard like what say like the I know somebody had asked before like what like and I said like there's websites that say like oh like these are things that you know but like one of the things that like I always see in those like checklists of boxes is like did they overcome like, were they able to like face a difficult situation and overcome it? Like, I can talk. Like, I can talk to that more um, with some with a student who's perhaps struggled in my class um, than one who just kind of sailed by and was great in it. Um, so yeah. So if you're willing to share some of that information again, I don't think you're ever obligated to tell your faculties like your whole life story, um, but share some of that and. I think also that goes into one of my pieces of recommendation I always tell for students is you don't have to have like a perfect GPA to like go to grad school, right? Like that's not an expectation. Um, and things like letters of recommendation are for, particularly for grad school are really important because well, how somebody looks on paper doesn't have anything to do. Like once you're in grad school, you're typically really building a close relationship with faculty and they really wanna know like, are you a decent human being? Um, is this somebody that like I'm going to be able to work with for five years in my lab helping them develop a dissertation and that the only thing that really can speak to that is a letter of recommendation from somebody who knows you well so and I would like to ask something that's very important I know we're just talking about letters of recommendations right now but if your CV doesn't match or it's not properly crafted uh, you can have the most wonderful letter of recommendation by a faculty and you will not get that into grad school. So just be careful. You know, I've seen students and I was like, why you didn't get into this PhD program? You're fantastic. You know, I wrote a beautiful letter and then like, let me take a look at your CV. And then I said, okay, this is why, you know, this is, these are the things that you need to correct and then apply again. And then they do that, luckily they listen. <laughs> You know, and now we have a better outcome. So yes, be, it's not just the letters. I know build connections, start on time ahead, you know, ask six weeks, four weeks in advance, but be, uh, you know, be sure that your uh, CV is actually built properly because that is very, very important. Okay, I don't know if Ari is gonna have another <laughs> uh, webinar about it, yeah. but it's something that I always stress my students. Uh, you yes so you have to tailor it for the position that you want to apply uh and and you know double check you know that's why networking is important because you can talk to other online students who are already experienced maybe they, they already have an mba and they know how to take a look at these things and provide a feedback 
So again, networking is very important. There is a community professors. We are here to help you. And, you know, again, my advice is it's not only the data, but also what goes with it, like the CV. Yeah, I, um, this, sometimes this comes down to a time thing. Like I'll have a bunch of letters of recommendation. I can't do this, but oftentimes if a student is asking me with enough time, I will also, and I ask them like, send me your statement of purpose or send me your resume. I actually really like editing resumes. I don't know what it is. I think it's really fun. Um, but like, I will, if I have time, I will edit that as like, I feel like that's part of my letter of recommendation process. It's like, I'm not going to take the time to write a letter of recommendation for you if like everything else is out of order. Um, but sometimes I don't have time to provide that, but most of the time um, I do, I consider that part of my letter of recommendation service. And maybe something that the advisors can help with. Right. We have the writing center. We have the advising group that's just dedicated for online students. I know like at Seoul, we have like at least eight people. Um, so again, talk to your advisors. They have the time. They they have all, you know, they have seen many of them and they will be your best support for that as well. Yeah, and ASU Career Services also has a resume drop, drop box. And so that is another feature um, that, um, you know, that you could take advantage of as an online student, you know, you're an ASU student, doesn't matter, online immersion. So remembering all those different resources that are available, that is also important. Um, I think that um, I always tell the online students, online students are very unique. I mean, and things that you think aren't very special about you are actually exceptionally special. You know, so for instance, the fact that you had you know, two different professional careers prior to coming back to school. That's really cool. You know, the fact that you're a parent, you know, that's really cool. But, you know, all those things that you think is irrelevant are actually really what makes you stand out. So, you know, believe in yourself and your story as an individual. And that is actually very unique from what we typically see in our on-campus population of students. Not that they're not special in their own way, but, you know, the life experiences that online students that typically bring um, as an adult that already are coming back because they have a prior degree or they are transfer students, et cetera, those are very interesting life milestones that you have under your belt that other on-campus students may not have. So, you know, if you want to share some aspects of your story as an individual to your faculty member, that actually builds genuine relationships. And, you know, you'll be very surprised. Some of, the, you know, with me, a lot of my students know my, you know, little bits about my life story because they ask and I'm willing to share. When you share, faculty are also very willing to share too. Um, you'll find that a lot of faculty members are fairly open uh, people. So thank you so much for uh, coming to the, the inaugural panel. Um, just so after this is over, the recording will reside in the um, hours website. And also you should receive a follow-up uh, sort of a questionnaire it's not supposed to be a daunting or anything to fill it out, but basically I'm trying to collect some ideas uh, that you would like to hear about in future panel sessions instead of me thinking it's good for you. Uh, the letter of rec was very easy because everybody asked me about that, the online students, but other things like, um, you know, that would be helpful, okay? So just, just uh, make sure to fill that survey out so that I know what you want to hear more about and learn more about in these future sessions. So thank you again for your time and thanks to all of our great faculty panelists uh, and also Preston who is here for technology support. Um, I know that it's you know late in the evening for a lot of you. So I hope that you get some rest um, and you can always reach out to me uh, with questions that you may have. Um, and it's never... Ah, to build relationships with professors that you may never have taken courses with. And that's, you know, our unique situation. So reach out with questions as needed. Um, and I'm always available to answer them as much as I can. So uh, thank you for attending um, and uh, have a great night. Thank you, Ara. Thank you.